and his whole career has got zero technical fouls and just cannot seem to get the proper respect from the officials uh, that he deserves. Uh, it was a very poorly officiated basketball game. Um, Zach Randolph, the most rugged guy in the game, had zero free throws, but somehow Kawhi Leonard had 19 free throws. First half, we shot 19 points, shot 19 shots in the paint, and we had six free throws. They shot 11 times in the paint, and they had 23 free throws. I'm not a numbers guy, but that doesn't seem to add up. Overall, 35 times we shot the ball in the paint. We had 15 free throws for the game. They shot 18 times in the paint and had 32 free throws. Kawhi shot more free throws than our whole team. Explain it to me. We don't get the respect that these guys deserve because Mike Conley doesn't go crazy. He has class and he just plays the game. But I'm not going to let them treat us that way. You know, I know Pop's got pedigree and I'm a young rookie, but they're not going to rook us. That's unacceptable. That was unprofessional. My guys dug in that game and earned the right to be in that game, and they did not even give us a chance. All right. Thank you. Take that for data. on the Greater STL Sports Network. Robert Bowlesley here with you. You can tweet me at rbowlesleyjr. You can tweet the Greater STL Sports Network at Greater STL SN. You can also find us on Facebook at Greater STL One Word Sports Network. Look for us on YouTube that way. We also do these live on Ustream at ustream.tv backslash channel backslash rbowlesleyjr. We started off with Here Comes the King. That was a song by the great Ernie Hayes, the organist for the Cardinals which we'll get into the why I played that. And also David Tisdale of the Memphis Grizzlies on what I think is one of the greatest coaching rants of all time. <laughs> Take that for that. Sports Center stole my stuff because, well, I've been lazy. Not, and I lost my notebook. Mostly laziness. And I'm not a lazy person, per se. Let's just, if I was at work right now, I'd be working my ass off, but... You know, you lose your, you, 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 that's, we'll just call it laziness. We play, but we played Here Comes the King because, as you know, that seems to be the song that is loved to be played at Blues and Cardinal games. And how about them Blues going, winning it five games in the first round against the Minnesota Wild? And it's, I kind of feel like Bruce Boudreau, the coach of the Wild, when he said that they weren't the better team, but they won four games. And they weren't the better team. I mean, they averaged 40 shots a game. Now, the Blues, as I keep getting at this, they don't play defense. They just don't. And with scores like Zach Parise and Mika Corview, you thought that was going to be a problem. But Jake Allen, who was just phenomenal in this series. It, I fell asleep on Jake Allen throughout the season that he had to get sent home. I was down for Carter Hutton playing in this series. I really was. I thought he was more aggressive on the offense, more aggressive at going after the pucks, coming out of the crease to make big saves. And it seemed like in this series that Jake Allen just changed the whole way he played. And it was nice to see. Tarasico only had one goal in the series. You got your game winner in game four from Magnus Payarvi. That's something I'm telling you right now that nobody in the world thought. Nobody ever looked at the Blues lineup and said, man, that Magnus Payarvi is going to get us the game winning goal. Yet he did. Tarasico didn't even score to game five. It was one of those series where you had to rely on your goalie and Jake Allen went out there and let them rely on him to win the game. And that's what happened. Now, it was a little rough shot in the game they lost where he played a, misplayed a puck, passed it right to the wild player, they scored. He allowed a soft goal in game five. 
But he kept the Blues in the game to get it a chance to get to overtime and then a chance to win the game on a Magnus Pyarvi goal. Now you... I don't understand why the Blues have a problem with playing defense. And I mean, you do have a lot of offensive defensemen. Paranko's one. They say Edmondson one. Eh. I mean, your only real defenseman is not a really good defenseman in Jay Bowmeister. And you're going to have to look down the road to see how that's going to affect you. Like, is the defense going to be able to step up to stop guys like Forsberg in this series? Are they going to be able, is the offense going to step up enough to get to pass a guy like Patrick Rene, who's played just as good as Jake Allen and played a better team than the Blues play when and they swept the Blackhawks. Which is nice to see that you'd like to get the number one T out, out of there. I would love to play the Blackhawks again. Just to see. Just to see if you could do it two years in a row. If you can beat your rival two years in a row row. But hey, if they're out of there by now, it's not a problem. But if you're gonna play the way you play defense in this last series, you're gonna have to have people step up. It was nice to see Stastny get out there in his first game and get a goal. Fabry supposedly skating today, which would be un 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 uh, unimaginable, as that's how you say the word, if uh, he could get out there and skate for you too. That, I mean, that provides extra offense. And you guys, you got guys that weren't even on this team. Point Zach Stanford of the world. Pyarvi doesn't make the biggest impact. If you could add another guy to this offense, you might not have to play that all great defense. And but you're gonna have to stop certain players. I mean, when your best line is the fourth line, to be honest with you, the, the best line that you've seen out there, you don't see it in the stats, and you don't see it on the score sheet or whatever you want to call it. But during the game, you can see that the Upshaw Braziak Reeves line is the line. That gets the Blues started. Now it's at times they do give up the puck. Ryan Reeves seems like a whole different player, which is nice to see. But then they're the guys that aren't going to step up for you to win you a series. You're going to have to have a guy like Tarasenko to stop turning over the puck. You're going to have to have a guy like Stassi to get out there to win you faceoffs. And give give you offensive zone chances because the Blues just don't win faceoffs. I mean that's nothing new. I mean people were calling for Saboka to be the the center man on the lines when you got guys guys have been playing all season at the center position like Steen. You got Stasny back. Barbashev doesn't win a whole bunch of faceoffs. You've seen Steen or excuse me Stasny on that line with Tarasenko to try to get things moving. And it's a little scary to think that they don't play defense when the Predators can score like they can. And I really don't see how the Blues can stop that. It seemed like the Minnesota really had a lot of shots just going straight down the middle, just basically out hustling the Blues. Now, you can look at the officiating and say it's a lot of the officiating's fault, a lot of bad icing calls, a lot of bad penalty calls. But the refs shouldn't be the team. The shouldn't be your fallback plan. You shouldn't have to worry about the refs. But the Blues need the help. <laughs> if the refs make bad calls against the Predators, it's helpful in a way to the Blues because this is a team that you didn't at first you didn't think was going to be in the playoffs. When Mike Yo came in. And then all of a sudden Mike Yo comes in. Jake Allen becomes the greatest goalie in the world. You have the best record in the league since he's came in. And it just seems kind of funny how everything turned around once Mike Yo got in there. And it's, it, it's nice to see. And it's probably a lot of weight off Mike Yo's shoulders. 
that he went out there and beat the team and fired him last year after making the playoffs. And I think four of the five seasons he coached there. So it's nice to see that. But the problem is you don't really you I really don't know what the Blues focus on when they do this. I don't know if they focus on offense or defense. You can't really tell. It's obviously been they've been focusing on goaltending, the way Jake Allen's played. It's obvious they that they try to still play that same little style that Hitchcock like to play, the dump and run, which I hate. I think it's the worst thing in hockey in the world to play that dump and run system. Where you have to go after every you dump the puck in, then you have to go every puck and puck. And if you don't get the puck, you've lost your offensive chance, which leads to other more offensive chances for the team. And hey, maybe if you play like you did in the last series, it's not a problem. There wasn't a whole lot of rebounds that Jake Allen let get out there. It seemed like that it was one shot, and it was either a face off or Jake Allen was getting the puck out of there and getting it to his players. But I think that the Predators are a faster team than the Wild. Plus, they have a better goaltender. It's not like Devin Dubnik, Dubnik is this great goalie. Now, he played a little better in this series, but it wasn't like the Blues were getting a bunch of shots off against them. Patrick Rene is a pretty good goalie. And you've seen that with guys like Patrick Kane, with guys like Jonathan Taze, guys like Duncan Keith that play for that play for the Blackhawks, that he didn't allow them to score. Kane didn't get a goal, I don't think, to the third or fourth game of the series. So it's kind of understandable to kind of be worried in a series. Now you have home ice advantage, which is always a good thing. You got two wild card teams going against each other. Blues with the better record gets them to be a home, have the own ice advantage. But the Blues' records on the road is a lot better than it has been home with Yo in there. So you kind of lose like a lot of your worries there because of the way that they played on the road, the way they kind of went out there and got the first goal and got the game going. To give your team a chance. But there's still a lot of problems. I mean, to go out there and get that first goal is great, but to not go out there and attack doesn't make quite as much sense to me. You see the Blues go out there, they score one goal, and it seems like they lay off. It seems like they dump and run. And not dump and run towards the puck, dump and run back into their zone. Like they're almost playing like they have a three-goal lead and they could just play defense the whole game. I mean, most of the time when you've seen the Blues not play the dump a run, it was with that fourth line. It was Reeves going out there trying to make a play. Which, his offense is ten times better than I ever thought. And he's proved it, he proved it throughout the season that he can play a little bit of hockey. But in this series, the way he handled the puck, some of the passes he made were beyond me. It was un, just not beyond me. And it's not like the Blues don't have good players in that line. Brozniak and Upshaw are longtime players in this league, and they're on a fourth line, which on most teams, you, you would see a Scotty Upshaw probably on a second or third line. You would see a guy like Brozniak, who wins faceoffs and is also a good passer, be on a second or third line. But the Blues seem to think that they have these great playmakers, which Steen did have an off year. Perron's Perron. And then you got Tarasenko, but after that, who do you got? I mean, Saboka, that's great. Maybe the Lusters wore off a little bit with him, I think. You don't, you didn't hear about, much about him in this series after the first game, except maybe on the face-offs. But the Blues are going to have to change the way they play in this series, mostly because the Predators can score. You're going to have to focus on trying to get that first goal again and, and keep on them. Well, there's no chance that you win in this series. There's no chance that Jake Allen's going to make every single save that he made in this series, two series in a row. I just don't think that's the chance. From the Jake Allen I know. And maybe I'm wrong. 
Because I've been on, I was on that Brian Elliott tra train, and you see what happened that Calgary series. They, they were up f four nothing in a game and ended up losing. Brian Elliott, after a great season he had, it just seemed like some kind of switch went on in Jake Allen's head that says, "If I got to keep this job, I'm going to have to play this way." But is he going to be able to keep it up as it goes on? And maybe you don't have to. Maybe if Fabry comes back, maybe this becomes nothing but an offensive team and you just hope the defense is good enough. And that's with Jake Allen being great again. You've seen a guy like Stasny get back in there and goal. Can he be that guy that's worth that contract you gave? Even though when you play in the Midwest, definitely in a, a game like hockey where the salary cap is, you're fighting the salary cap at all times. No matter whether you have a really crappy team or you are the Blues or the Chicago Blackhawks. Now, the Blackhawks do keep a lot of their good players, but they lose guys here and there, mostly on the defensive side. And you've seen how it affected them in this series. Is they were basically in the same boat as the Blues. Is they were going to try to score to win the game, and they couldn't do it. And hockey's a whole different animal than most sports. And you hear about CNI singles. You, you see the bounces off the rim in basketball. Hockey's a whole different thing. A lot of deflected pucks. Uh, you've seen the, a couple bounces in all the series. I'm, I can't remember who it was, but uh, I think it might have been Pe Pekka Renna. Nashville a puck bounced off the partition and almost went in and he had to dive and knock the puck out of there. Jake Allen had to do it one time too. So the bounces are a whole lot different in hockey than they are in any other sport. And then one of the things that the Blues, I don't know, can come back from, if it can be accounted for. But they're going to have to play some kind of defense. They're going to have to go back and look at things that they could do different on the defensive side to make that offense better. Because the Blues just don't control the puck past the, the neutral zone on the offensive side. And it seems really hard that they have a lot of trouble getting the pucks out of that zone. And I don't like that most of the players, definitely Tarasenko, as you know, didn't like the style that Ken Hitchcock played. But it seemed like the Blues were a better defensive team. But their record wasn't as good, so you're kind of a loss for anything to figure out what kind of style that this team's going to play. Most likely, as Yo, who was the coach in waiting, is he did he learn some things from Hitchcock to try to make this team more of a defensive team? And it's crazy to think that changing the goalie coach. Now, I you understand who the goalie coach is now the two goalie coaches, both former NHL goalies, but one of them is Mark Tam Brodeur. Did that really make that big of a difference in Jake Allen? Because there's, Brodeur said in an interview that he thinks that Jake Allen could be one of the best goalies in the league. Now, is that your coach saying that? Or is that Mark Tam Brodeur, the former greatest goalie of all time, saying that? So it's really a lot to ponder going into this series. Can they stop Forsberg? Can they pit pucks pack Patrick Rene? Can they control the puck in the zone, in the offensive zone, to keep the pucks from and keep them weird bounces in the defensive zone? There's a lot of variables that go into this series. Now you gotta think that Tarasenko is gonna get some kind of streak going to where he plays a different style where he, does, he doesn't try to do it all himself. Stasny's going to help that, have not having to worry about a guy like Barbashev. Because basically, when you have Barbashev on the line, it was Schwartz and Tarasenko. And plus, with Tarasenko and Schwartz out there, Barbashev's the center man, we weren't winning a whole lot of face off. So the Stasny kind of combat that when the, the way we play. 
He likes seeing his team score. He's going to have to step it up. I like the way Schwartz plays, but you would like to see some pucks get into the net. But this is going to be a series where you have to keep the puck and you have to start controlling the puck. You can't let 50 shots go against Jank Allen and only have 25 to 30 shots. I mean, you had the lowest amount of shots of all the playoff winning teams on average per game. And it mostly seemed like in the second and third periods, and the Blues had a lot of leads in this series, as it had seemed like it got worse as the game went on. You're not going to be able to fall in that trap when you got Rene as a hot goalie. You're not going to be able to fall into that trap when they got guys like Forsberg out there making the plays he can make. So there's going to have to be some kind of adjustment as this, as you switch series. Now, I don't like the whole thing where you basically get a week off in between your final games because you're waiting on the other series. And I know that's the way it's got to go. You're trying to keep all the fans into it. You're trying to see them watch these good games, games five, six, and seven on the other series to kind of keep you in the flow. But it hurts the players in a way. And you're hoping that they didn't fall into a, a lax. You're hoping that they didn't fall. That they don't fall from being tired and being worn out from taking a break. Because that's what happens with you. You're going to get tired. You're going to get lazy when you have to take breaks like this. And and every player, every team has to deal with it, which is always a good thing. Nashville's got a little bit longer going than the Blues. You would kind of you kind of hope that the Blues maybe lost another game to kind of extend it to where they had games in between the break. So as the series gets started off on Wednesday in St. Louis, you kind of hope the Blues just go out there and just run rough shot. If they go out there and they just put pucks on the net, that you that you make throw a lot of shots at the goal that, and you see like most of the, a lot of the goals in the NHL now are a shot against the goalie. They shoot it at an angle, bounces off to the next player, boom, wide open net. But you're going to have to put pucks in the net for that kind of things to happen. And you have to win face-offs. You have to win face-offs. That's what has to happen. And it's not... Like, if the Blues don't win face-offs, it's just they don't win enough of them. They also don't put a lot of, uh, enough shots on the net to have them offensive plays where you go out there and get the rebound. And you're going to have to do that against the Predators. The problem is you have to go back and stop it on your side. You can't allow that to happen, which the Blues did a great job of. I mean, a lot of the shots where Jake Allen pushed it to the blue line, got it to the blue line, Defensive players in front of the net making sure that they kept the puck out of their, not out of their zone, but away from the goalie. He got lucky one time, Parisi knocked the puck back out of the net in a game. You got maybe a lucky call with the goal that wasn't allowed where the goalie interference, which you've seen the puck go in before really what I consider interference getting called. You're not going to get them lucky breaks in every series. I mean, this is not going to happen. You're going to have to play good offensive defense. You're going to have to play good defense against a good offensive team, and then you're going to have to play exceptional offense against a great goal. And maybe that goes for both teams. But I'm not really worried about Nashville. St. Louis, baby. 3 one foe. <laughs> but that's the that's what I'm that's what's going to have to happen. Is you're going to have to step up your game in the areas that you've seen the Blues lack in, which is getting pucks on net and keeping teams out of their zone. And that's, I mean, that's hockey. And that's just the way it's going to work. And if the Blues don't do that, they're not going to win. If you're not going to get the same great play that you got in the last series, out of out, I just, and I keep saying it, and I, it's just because it's, it's almost impossible. You have to. The shots you don't, you can't score on shots you don't take. Wayne Gretzky, Michael Scott, blah, blah, blah. 
So you're going to have to put pucks in the net to win this game, this is a series. So if you see players like Tarasenko step up, Schwartz, Stasny, Fabry, if he comes back, but if it ain't Fabry, that fourth line, the third line with Perron, and whoever else you throw out there, Stanford, uh, Saboka. Certain players that didn't step up need to step up. Your defense can't provide all your scoring because they have to play defense sometimes. You can't have Joel Edmondson be your offensive star. You just can't have it. I don't see Joel Edmondson being your outstanding star in this series. So, Wednesday, 7 o'clock, Blues against the Predators. I didn't see what station it's on. Look it up. They're no longer I'm going to be on Fox Sports Midwest. They can only get the first round. You can't hear them on KMOX, which is good. I don't think that there's like a national hockey radio thing like you know, ESPN or anything like that because ESPN doesn't really. They're getting better at the hockey thing, but I think they still show more WWE than they do hockey, which is kind of, it's hard for me to watch ESPN anymore. I mean, I, I do watch Sports Center, but other than the 30 for 30s, I mean, ESPN kind of wet. I mean, Fox Sports 1 is nowhere near ESPN's status. But it's kind of gotten me off of uh, watching ESPN is the way they're changing the network. The first take is going to be their main, it's their main show now. Maybe it'll change a little bit when Mike and Mike, Mike Greenberg goes to ESPN, which I'm not a big fan of Mike and Mike. If I, won, if I was in New York, I'd be a big fan of Mike and Mike, but I'm not a Jets fan. I'm not a New York guy. It's just ESPN. I, I, I think that they're trying to change the network to make it more more news, more and try and throw some funniness in there, but they, they seem like they're trying to make it more like in a CNN or something where they're putting guys in positions where they don't really have opinions, where they're, they're really going out there and they're really news people. They're used to reading on the popper, uh, a prompter. That they're trying to ha ha make have opinions about things that most people don't have opinions about. But yeah, Blues, seven o'clock Wednesday. We'll see how this series goes as it goes on. Let's move on to the Cardinals. And shala shala, here comes the Cardinals. No. I'm not going to talk good about Cardinals. Number one, this show from now on is going to be called the Sports Blog, a.k.a. the Ray Lankford for Cardinals Hall of Fame show. And when the All-Star break comes, when hockey's over, we're not really setting up for football anymore. There's not much going on. When the All-Star break comes, I'm going to do, I think, and I don't know how much I went into it the last 2015 when I was complaining about it. I didn't really do too many shows in 2016, only two. We're surpassing, we're tying that right now. But Ray Langford deserves to be in the Hall of Fame before any of the players that are on this list now. Mark McGuire, Steve Carlton, who didn't play that much for the Cardinals, Scott Rowland, Jason Isringhausen. You're going to tell me that a guy who has the most home runs at one of your stadiums, guy that almost won Rookie of the Year, a guy that controlled center field for the Cardinals for until Jim Edmonds came from the 90s until Edmonds came, you're going to tell me he doesn't deserve any respect. To me, that's disrespectful, the way they're treating Ray Lankford. And now you don't hear Ray Lankford talk, and maybe it was the beef with Tony La Russa and Walk Jockety and Moselec's a Jockety crony, even though he came from Colorado, he still worked on a Jockety. Maybe that's something to do with it. But to me, it's disrespectful to treat one of the best players on a, you had nothing else to strive to look at when you were in the Cardinals in the 90s. It was Ozzie and Ray Lankford until 1998. There was nobody else. McGuire doesn't get to where he gets to without Ray Lankford behind him. And I look enough of this stuff up. I look up the most random shit on the internet. The most random. I'm telling you. I mean, I've been listening to wrestling podcasts lately to try to make this show better. Just to see what people listen to, to see what I can do to make, try to make the show better. Not that I'll follow anything. I like the show the way it is. I don't. I mean, and it'll get better as we move on. We're we're, we're trying, blah blah blah. But to disrespect a guy like that doesn't make any sense to me. He didn't like the manager, Tony Russo. Oh well, Tony Russo's in the Hall of Fame now. Ozzy Smith's finally coming back around. Obviously, 
that his beef with LaRusso didn't matter that much. You see other players coming around. You got Scott Rowland going in a, or has a chance to go in there. He didn't get along with LaRusso too much. So it's just not understanding to me the guy that played as well as he did for your team for as many years as he did. And even when he came back in 04, he started off having a good year and it and an injury kind of cost him. We went out, we had Reggie Sanders, we went out and got Larry Walker to replace him as he was injured. But it doesn't make any sense why it's happening. And I'll go more into it later in the year when I have nothing else to talk about. I might just do it. I might just do the sports blogger that do an hour special on Ray Langford, to be honest. But you might the guy that made me want to play baseball. It's him and Griffey. I'm nowhere near as fast. I couldn't hit good as neither one of them. But them are two people that made me want to play baseball. That love, that made me, that make baseball my favorite sport to love. And it's just disrespectful to me that they, they treat them like this. And you got guys in there that don't deserve to go in there before him with a chance to go in there. McGuire, I'm a steroid user. Carlton, who didn't play here all that long. I like the Tim McCarver thing. That's if anybody goes in this year, it's gonna be McCarver. If anybody else goes in, I'm not gonna respect that until Ray Langford's in. And that's about as honest as I can be. Now, I'm not gonna stop watching the Cardinals. Maybe I won't talk about them as much. Maybe that's my way of getting at them, even though I doubt any of the Cardinals, anybody that's ever played for the Cardinals, much less, has heard this show. But it's not understandable how that happens. But back to 2017. Now it's great they won six out of seven. Great. Awesome. Who did you play? It's not like you were out there playing the Cubs. It's not like you were playing the Nationals who and you did. Guess what? You lost. Giants, any any of the major teams, you played the two worst teams in your division. You played the Pirates and the Brewers. And it's not like you played all that great. You've had some good pitching against a non-hitting team, which has been a non-hitting team over the past. They've been a pitching team in the Pirates. Great. You won the games two to one. Now you're against the Brewers. Great. You're playing the Brewers who have nothing. They don't have pitching. They don't have hitting. They have one hitter. Two hitters. You want to count Braun. I don't count steroid users. If he can be whatever he wants, I don't count him. I don't. He, and he's, it's not like he was hitting all his great in the series either. Dames, they kept him quiet. But this, they don't. They, you played two of the, the worst teams in baseball. And I mean, it's great. Divisional baseball, great, awesome. You have to win against your division. And you have to beat the bad teams. The Reds are better than you. And they have five starters on the DL. And they can't hit. You have the Cubs who... The only pitcher that's actually pitching halfway decent is Lester... Or not Lester, excuse me. Jake Arrieta. Farmington guy. But they have nothing. And you have to play them. And now you get another luck shot series when you go when you play the Blue Jay. The, yeah, you've ran to a good time, but it's not like they're hitting. Your two best hitters are on the bench. The two best hitters in your lineup are on the bench. And Jed Jerko and Jose Martinez. Other than that, there's nothing else that makes you think this team is any good. Your best pitcher is Mike Leak. Which, thank God for him, or you'd be nowhere. You got lucky with Wayne Wright hitting the home run and getting the RBIs. But he only went five innings. After that, the bullpen sucks. Martinez hasn't been that great. Wakas goes in and out. You're not a good team so far this season. And there's a lot of ways to go. And like I said last week, to harp on it, it's, and this early in the season is, a little harsh. But to go out there and like you did something special, like people act like the Cardinals, wow, the Cardinals are coming from 3-9 and nine to 9-10 and 10 or whatever it was. Great. 
beat the Brewers and the Pirates. Not go play the Cubs or something. Go play the Giants. Go play the Nationals and then prove to me something. Prove to me something this week when you go play the Blue Jays, who suck, who were the worst team to start the season. It's great that you can beat the bad teams. And have gotten lucky. Your pitchers, your pitchers have been your best hitter. Wayne Wright and Lee, they've won your game. Fowler had to win your game. She had nothing else but Fowler with two solo shots to win your game. It's not like the, this is like this is something great that's going on. And of course they're going to act like it. And it's and, and it's nice to see the Cardinals get right back in it with the Cubs struggling the way they are. And maybe this turns into an 06 thing. Or was it 06? It was 06 or two. It's one of them. I think it was 06, but you win a division with like 88 wins. Maybe it turns into something like that because you don't have that great of teams in a division. But for people to be out here praising them because they won six or seven, give me six or seven good games. But you, you haven't done that. You haven't gone out there and played offense, good offense. You haven't gone out there and played good defense. And that's what was the point of the team, pitching and defense. Well, you haven't done either one of them either. You ran into a good part of your schedule. So we go out there and cheer it and be like, yay, Cardinals. Are, no, they're not. No, they're not coming. They're not doing nothing. It doesn't make any sense to me why people think that this is like some big thing that the Cardinals want because they're not a good team. And things could change because it's so early in the season. You're 19 games in. That means you got 142 to go or 143 to go. So things need, there's still things when you're trying to say this is a good team that need to turn around. And it's all three facets, main facets of the game. Pitching, definitely the bullpen. You've seen Broxton go out there again. Oh, still having a little bit of trouble. You know, he got out there and got five saves this week. Your best pitcher has been Trevor Rosenthal. It's nice to have Lions up because they can't figure out the whole Peralta thing. I can figure out the whole Peralta thing. Buy Peralta. Become a bench player. Go out there and play when they need you. As they're finally starting to get over some of the things that the Cardinals do, which is they say things and they try to go out there and do them with Adams and Peralta. And they're finally getting over them. And I don't know if that's a whole Matheny thing with the lineups doing that, throwing Adams out there, putting Peralta in the lineup. And Mazalek finally said, no, I'm doing, I'm coming back. Mazalek has more on this lineup than you think. He's more of a coach than you would think. And I'm a, I would love to see Jed Jerko in there more. Greg Garcia, even though Wong's starting to hit a little bit one game. Greg Garcia get more time. Jose Martinez get some more at-bats with either getting Jerko starts and Carpenter starts at third. Jerko could play short. He could play some second base. So there's ways to get these players in there that aren't hitting to hit. Or, excuse me, there's ways to get players that are in there are hitting to be in this lineup. Maybe there's ways to get, I, you know, I messed that up, but who cares? We're going with the flow again, like the hair. But it's just something, it's just, it's amazing to me why how people could change their whole attitude against when you, because you won six or seven against two of the worst, two of the worst teams in your division, the two worst teams in your division. So, I mean, it's one. 43 to go. So I mean, I understand. Or 142, 162, 143. There's my math. Major coming in. Don't have a math. But I mean, it's just effed up to me. I mean, and most of it's coming from people from St. Louis. Most of it's coming from the writers on Twitter and stuff like that. And the best fans of baseball are great at proving these facts, which is awesome. Gives me something to do during the day. But that's just the way things work. You want six or seven against two of the worst teams. Now you're the greatest team. In no, play good teams. And I'm not. I'm the Cardinals will lose this week against the Blue Jays. And I'm gonna. And I, I'm gonna harp on it again. You. I mean, I understand you have to beat the bad teams, 
and it's great that they're doing it. But show me something against these bad teams. You're lucky that you don't get Strowman. You passed him up, which is great. That helps you in the three games. But then you're going to have guys go out there like Waka, who's been off. Martinez is going to pitch in this series. So, you're going to see kind of where the Cardinals are at, again, with the players that haven't stepped up. Because you're playing a bad team. But you have to keep it going. You have to beat good teams to win. And they haven't done it yet. They couldn't beat the Reds, who do, whose whole starting step is on the DL. So you're playing against a bunch of no-name players already on offense and a bunch of no-name pitchers, and you can't beat them. And you got lucky that you beat the teams you did. It was two. It was three two-to-one games against the Pirates. Anyway, the ball bounces. That's a whole different series. Milwaukee doesn't have a bunch of hitters. And you won two games because of your pitching. Pitchers hitting. And Leak pitching. Leak has been great. And it's nice to see that. And you're playing a little bit better defense. Or he wouldn't be that good. As it's moved on. But he's been good when you weren't playing good defense. So we'll see how that moves on with the Cardinals. And for our new segment of the show, Fuck the Rams Weekly. And this is probably something you've seen, but we'll move it on. And just for fun, Johnny Hacker, because your Twitter sucks too, just like Robert Quinn's last week. But the city has filed a suit, it's along with the county and the regional sports commission, com- convention, sports complex, authority, blah, blah, blah. And which they've sued the NFL for basically lies in the city, to the city about the Rams leaving. And this is from April 13th in the Post-Dispatch. The city and county regional convention and sports authority are suing the NFL over the relocation of the Rams. The 52-page suit filed Wednesday, which was before the Wednesday before April 13th, and St. Louis Circuit Court lists all 32 league teams and the National Football League as defendants and seeks damages and restitution of profits. The suit claims St. Louis has lost an estimated $1.8 million to $3.5 million a year in amusement and ticket revenue with the departure of the Rams. It also says the city has lost about seven point five in property tax and $1.4 million in sales tax revenue, plus millions in earning tax. Although it doesn't provide dollar amounts for the St. Louis County, the suit says the county has lost out on hotel tax, property tax, and sales tax revenue based on the departure of the Rams. We'll get into the county in a minute. The suit contains five counts or causes for action. Breach of contract against all defendants, unjust enrichment against all defendants, fraudulent misrepresentation against the Rams team owners Dan Kroenke, fraudulent misrepresentation against all 32 teams, and tortious interference with business expectancy against all defendants except the Rams. The last count basically alleges that the NFL and the other 31 teams intentionally interfered with the business relationship between St. Louis plaintiffs and the Rams by approving the relocation. And this is basically based off the relocation guidelines that the Rams, that the city felt like they should have followed. Now to go to the county for a second, before I get more into this little lawsuit, is you can't come with the city to help with the stadium. You can't come to the city for help with the soccer team. You can't help the city with crime. But all of a sudden, it involves with somehow you get a chance to get some money, and now you want to be involved. That just sounds so, so St. Louis. That sounds so St. Louis to me. Definitely St. Louis count. All of a sudden, when it comes to risking anything, no, absolutely not. We're not helping you do nothing. When it comes to all of a sudden, we're going to make a little money off of it, then we're gonna get we're gonna get in this lawsuit. We lost some hotel tax, which you didn't. Not many people are, I mean many people you might go stay in the county to go to hotels, but not many people are traveling to watch the St. Louis Rams play. I, I all but promise you that. 
I had money to do it. I wasn't going down there from St. Charles. I'm surprised St. St. Charles, which is money hungry as can be, but at least St. Charles gets stuff done. The county and the city don't. I, and that's why St. Charles Fire ain't We got better things to worry about than the Rams leaving. We got football at St. Charles. Uh, <laughs> but all of a sudden, when, it, it just, when things get down to it, the county will wash St. Louis out of there until it became about money. About them gaining money. When it was about them spending a little bit of money. It was, no, 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 no. We can't do that. We can't do that. We got to help the county. But now we want some, they want some hotel tax revenue. They want to come back and try to gain something off of this. But well, they deserve nothing. They deserve nothing. They didn't try to keep the team here at all. They had their chance. They said no. Blitz and Peacock and the rest of the keep the Rams and St. Louis team. Went out there and did everything else through the city. And gave the best shot without the county's help to keep the Rams here. And it's probably based off that the lawyers are based out of the county, so they the more help you get, the better. But we could have used that help before when we were losing our team and they didn't want to give it to us. So why even get them involved in a suit to try to gain? Some money when they didn't want to lose any money. And they're not losing any money. It's different if this was the Cardinals, because there's probably new people that there's teams places all over the Midwest, Arkansas, Alabama, Tennessee, Iowa, maybe even Kansas. They come here for trips to watch the Cardinals. Now, to get in a lawsuit involved in the Rams, that just ain't happening. And that's just effing St. Louis. If they wanted this money so bad, why didn't they try to keep the team here then? So there's my little rant about the county. But in this lawsuit, going back to the lawsuit, they went to interviews that were given to radio stations, interviews that were given to newspapers, not just here, but in LA. So the Rams said, hey, we're doing this, we're doing this, we're doing this to keep the team here. And Jeff Fisher, Kevin Devoff, Kroenke have given interviews in LA that contradict everything they said. And does this lawsuit have a chance? Maybe. What all the facts that they have been given. With the interview saying where we weren't looking anywhere else but the Keats Rams in St. Louis. And then they go out there and say, well, when Crocky Thunderland he called me, I'll never forget where I was. Or that they were trying to build a winner here in St. Louis, but oh, we were in the playoff hunt. And we were glad we went on that losing streak because it gave us a better chance to move to LA. So to me, that that's pretty damning evidence. Now they're saying that the now NFL are, at first were saying the relocation guidelines were the big deal that we're going to follow them. Then they just became more like an outline what you should do, not what you have to do. Now is are they going to get any of this money back? I doubt it. Are they going to get as much money back that covers their expenses for the Rams or what they would have gained from the Rams? Doubt it. But at least we're trying something. I mean, we deserve a little more than to be disrespected and lied to. Not only as a city, not and the Peacock and Blitz thing, but as fans who went down there and paid the money and did all that, and paid for the little small upgrades that they make on they made on the dome, which wasn't much. That thing was like, honestly, like a big basement with nice little flags hanging from the wall. It was like it looked like people were up there making a look like a bunch of hammocks hanging from the wall. I mean, that that place just wasn't like the greatest thing in the world. 
At the time of the Rams, it might have been because they wanted to move. But this also was the problem that you had this lease. This is your fault too. So now you're kind of contradicting yourself and saying, well, we want money back because we had a shitty lease. That's not, you're, you're basically blaming yourself for what happened and trying to recount for it. In my eyes. Now to be lied to and all that is understandable. Broken promises, that's understandable. But that's what happens in business. People lie. So I don't know what understand. That's what I don't understand is what they think that they're going to make off this when you made the original plan to get the Ramsey out. And to be lied to and all that, yeah, that's a big thing. To be told one thing and then see that there was another going on, yeah, that's a big thing. But you gave them the out that made this happen. So it's not understandable what you're looking for. And maybe they're just doing it for pride. But this is your fault. You can't try to gain pride off something that you let happen because you wanted a football team that bad. Why would the Ram? Why did the city never try to rework the lease to get that the stipulations out of there to cost the Rams a chance to leave? Why would them never change? It's like this. You had plenty of time to do it before Stan Kroenke was in in there. Te you people work out rework leases all the time. You went to a year to year. Did you ever try to rework the lease then? That's that. These are things that are going to come out. And yeah, maybe the relocation was appro approved, and maybe that 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 goes back to where it shouldn't have been because of relocation guidelines. And maybe that's the city and county small out, but they had the out too. The Rams did, and the NFL. And they took it full-fledged. And I don't think St. Louis was expecting that. Obviously not because it didn't happen until the Rams said they were going to move. They didn't suspect it. And then now you're, you're running around like a chicken with your head cut off. Whose fault is that? That's not the Rams' fault. That's not the NFL's fault. That's the people who made the lease and didn't, give them, and didn't try to accompany it any other way. Like you couldn't maybe rework the lease where it added another five years and you had a chance to rebuild the stadium or work on the dome or do whatever they could do. And maybe this is just a ploy to get some money to get the soccer team. And maybe Stan Kroenke comes out, $60 million out of his pocket in the NFL, who are building soccer teams now, soccer stadiums now across the seas so that the Rams are allowed to play there. Or not the Rams, excuse me. The teams are allowed to play their two games a year. I can't remember the stadium. I should have wrote it down. Laziness. But they're giving money to one of the soccer teams across the East so the NFL can play two games a year. Maybe they see that and that's what they think is going to happen. So it's not, it's just not understanding to me what they think they're going to get out of this. And that's me going against it. And it's a great lawsuit, and it's awesome that they're actually trying to do something, but is it really going to work? And again, it's a last-minute thing, just like building the stadium was. Just like letting the lease go year to year, and then at the last minute when they got the chance to get out, they actually try to do something about it. What's the point of trying to get something that's on you too. And maybe they go at it 50-50. Maybe they say the Rams are 50% responsible. St. Louis is 50% responsible. And now you're at the point to where maybe you get half this money back. I just think if you look at the lawsuit, maybe the NFL should just come out of pocket with whatever, the whatever, make a settlement and just stop all this from coming out. Because there's going to be a lot of things that come out. Interviews, 
things like that. But there's also things in there, like Rams Park. Maybe you get something for that, which I think that the Rams, not the Rams, but St. Louis has put a lease on that for something with the soccer, one of the soccer things, Leo Fuse or something like that, um, Tony Glavin thing. I can't remember. But maybe it's something that works out like that. But this is a joint venture that's 50% you and 50% them. So basically, flip a quarter, you tell me who wins. <laughs> now, I seen a pretty funny picture this weekend with the uh, Michael Jackson kids, Paris Jackson and her godfather, Macaulay Culkin. Why that's funny to me is beyond me. It was kind of a fun picture. Macaulay Culkin still looks like he's getting out there and getting it. And who knows what they're doing together. I... Whatever happened to that situation? Like, where do the kids go? Because you don't know who the mom... Well, you don't know. We don't know. Someone knows who the mom is, though. But to see them in the news is hilarious to me. See them sitting on each other's lap. Wow. And this is sees how stars work together. They're always going to be something, somewhere together. But this is funny to me. And I wrote it down to get into it, but... It's kind of funny you move from a life to where Michael Jackson was supposed to die from drugs and everything, and now her kids hanging out with the his kids hanging out with known drug addicts and Macaulay Culkin and stuff like that. This shows how the world works. Which I wouldn't have a problem. If I was hanging out with Paris Jackson. I don't know how old she is. I probably shouldn't say that. Um, scratch that from the tape here. Uh, and Macaulay Culkin looks like a fun guy to hang out with. I mean, that's if you want to get fucked up, that's probably the guy to go hang out with. Home Alone and all that. I don't know how much money he has anymore. You see him in little small parts here and there, just like you see uh, Haley Joe Osment was on uh, Entourage and stuff like that. Kid from the Sixth Sense. Those are probably the guys to hang out with. It. And he's been getting it for a while, you know, with the money they got his kids and stuff like that. Like Sense Six, Home Alone. So. She probably wants to go out and party. She, you know, you, you probably have a sheltered life when you're a kid of Michael Jackson. You know, even though you're hanging out at the Neverland Ranch with the amusement park and uh, stuff like that. But now that she's not sheltered anymore, she probably uh, wants to go out there and, you know, out there getting it. And, hey, I want to be at that party too. But just a quick picture I thought that I, you know, and I'm not a big partier. And if I was, that would be the party I'd go to, the McKelly Calkin Paris Jackson party. Uh, over any other celebrity that's out there, the Kardashians or whatever. And that little, small little, I guess we'll call it a genre where you see the partiers like that. But it would be nice to go get, you know, effed up with a movie star. No, I'd be more on the Willie Nelson train or uh, Snoop Dogg. Uh... I was listening to the X-Pac podcast. He was talking about it. Guys like that would be kind of fun to hang out with. You know, you're just chilling around. Just... And it would be kind of fun to hang out with them anyways. I just kind of hear the stories. Now, I got some effed up stories about times I got drunk. I mean, climbing out broken windows when I got drunk. and took some uh, Percocets. Uh, some jump, some uh, up four for four and drunk driving charges, which I never got charged, you know. They're fun times. Uh, there's some stories we can't talk about because it hasn't been seven years yet. Uh, we'll talk about them if this is going to seven years. I'll make sure to write that down, you know, even though I seem to lose notebooks and I had to go re redo all the weird news, which I, I change the stories up, which is always good, which isn't my mainstay. Now, the parties I don't want to go to are the ones on airplanes. With this United thing, they had scorpions and beating up people, and some gay couple was in the news whining about United. Some, yeah, you guys probably start giving out flights. Now there was other ones, that, and this is why I would never fly on a plane anywhere. And not only because they crash, not only because they can disappear. The Malaysia flight, uh, Amelia Earhart 
they <laughs> merely error, things like that. But there was people in Korea, and they were trying to get at the airport for Korea that were arrested and going to jail. Now you know in a different country, they're going to interrogate the fuck out of you. That's what's going to happen. And they're going to get to you basically to say what you got to say about however they need to torture you and stuff like that. But some of these people get like hard labor for 15 years. And I was reading stories last night where like the, the Korea jails for 15 years, you're eating grain and getting beat and you're out there working for 15 No, no, I'm not risking that. 16 hours a day is in a restaurant is different. 16 hours a day of hard labor. No, and eating grains of corn and rotten beans. I'm good. I'm good on getting an airplane and getting stuck in a situation like that. Or getting beat up because United doesn't know how to unbook flights, which it happens to have all of them. And that's just things that I don't want to happen. This is something I don't want to get involved in. And it, it just keeps scaring me and scaring me from uh, riding on planes. I would never be on a plane. You would never see me on an airplane. Now, I mean, maybe if I become like a some kind of famous newspaper writer or sports guy, maybe I'll go ride on a plane with the Cardinals. I'll trust that a little bit. But I'm not just going to get on a plane to go to Florida or California. Maybe Colorado, just for fun. Maybe, you know, hang out in Colorado. Colorado's not that far. But, uh, actually, tried to make it there one time. I didn't quite make it. Another story for another day. Trying to be a cool runaway at 16. Didn't work out. Ended up in jail. Just... For y'all to know, if you want to run away anytime soon, you end up in jail. Promise you. They take you to jail before you get to go hang out with your parents and shit like that. Promise. And feed you the beans and rice and corn and whatever the hell they have in jail. Which, jail's in... Other than St. Charles, we'll go... St. Charles, no. That's the last jail you want to be in. But the rest of them, a lot better than hard labor. I mean, that's crazy to even think about. That you could go to another country, and I think one had like 10 years for putting up a political sign or ripping one down or something crazy like that. That is that's nutty. It's just a, and that's why you'll never see me on a plane. You'll never see me probably out of this country. I barely want to leave the city I'm in now. I did it the other day and got stuck and all this stuff and it ended up taking me two and a half hours late to get home and some of the most ridiculous things I've ever been in my life because I left home and much less to get on a plane. I'll drive. I hate driving, but it's my, it's got to be much better to get on a plane, to be honest with you. <laughs> Planes scare me in general. Crashing a plane, a missing plane. And they keep coming on the story and people still fly on planes, which makes zero sense to me. But you can get on this plane. And um, the Michigan team, basketball team, early in the year in the tournament. Got their playing in their practice jerseys. Because their team playing ran off the runway. A few years in Chicago, playing was about to hit some houses. I might have hit some houses running off the runway. No. No. Plus, they blow up. Engines blow, all kinds of stuff. And the, the guy, um, Solenberger, who had to land a plane on the river. No. Then you watch the uh, airplane movie, the airplane guy getting drunk with uh, Denzel. You can probably get in drive flying. No, I'm good, people. I'm good. You want to go out of state, you fly, I'll drive. I'll see you in about 24 more hours. I'll, I'll spend the extra day driving. Because it's not like a flight's cheap. I mean, if you can book it months and months in advance, that's awesome. But they're not cheap. They can't be that much cheaper than gas. I mean, you definitely if you get one of these <laughs> brand new cars that get 40 miles a gallon. It can't be much more. But I'm not going to get beat up. I'm not going to get lost. I'm not going to crash. And I'm not going to do hard labor in a Korean prison. Promise you that. And it's crazy to see this type of stuff. It's like you see it every day. It's not just United though. It's American. And I don't even know. I don't even know them all anymore. I mean they have all combine and do all whatever they do so it just scares the sh living crap out of me to even think about going on a plane like I'll probably never like let my kids on a plane until they're old enough to do what they want and they probably I probably won't let them do it then 
So, but if my son gets any bigger, I'm going to start lifting weights and shit to stop him. Dude, that dude's getting huge. I'm almost scared of my nine-year-old son. The dude's getting so big. I don't know if he's my kid or not. You know, he gets strong as hell. But yeah, you'll never see me on a plane ever, ever, ever. I promise you this. Ever, 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 ever. Now we're reading this uh, newspaper out here where I'm living now, and you know you. The county, I think we got the Suburban Journal. Oh, here we got what we call the leader. And I'm going to have a story from the leader in a weird news segment here in a little bit. But, like, they're getting, like, it's crazy to, like, see these little papers and see what they put in there. Like, the St. Charles one's not that bad. But the one out here, like, the first thing I seen was couples that filed for a divorce. Why is that in a newspaper? And who's telling the news? Are you telling? Are you calling the leader and saying that, uh, hey, I filed for divorce? Like, how do they find this kind of stuff? Like, it, I mean, it, are they doing records checks and stuff like that? Now, I would never get married. Now, if Michelle, I think it was Michelle's Waterman, oh, the karate hottie, if she came here right now, she's a UFC fighter, look her up. It's karate hottie, best way to go. I had her name written down. I don't see it on my little sheet right here. No, I'll marry her. She's got to be the hottest UFC fighter of all time. But she can actually fight. Which is, I mean, that's scary. But if she can fight and do all this other stuff in the crowd, I just think what she could do in the bedroom, you know, that's something I'd marry. But to me, marriage is just a little slip of paper that says, we're conjoined. We got the same last name now. And I kind of like 50% of my stuff. I like 100% of my stuff. But I like the 50% that's possibly I could lose much more than I like the 50% of the stuff that I can't lose. So that's part of the marriage thing to me. And why people get married, like if you have to get a piece of paper saying that you're legally together, to feel like you're together, then there's no point in marriage. To me. It seems like it's a made-up lie almost. Like, this says we're together. No. Me being sitting next to you on the couch watching Family Guy or Simpsons or the Big Bang Theory, that says we're together. Not a piece of paper to cut if we have the same last name. No. Not doing it. Doesn't make any sense to me. Now, if Michelle, the, the karate hottie Michelle came by and said that, then we might have something going on. <laughs> I might have to go get that piece of paper then. Or even uh, the the new UFC fighter, which I looked her up because the UFC had a fighter with fake breast implants. She's not looking that bad either. Or the story I'm about to talk about in a minute. But and we'll get into that in a little second. But it's just funny that I, like when I was looking up weird news and it's something I do. I go through a lot of stuff. Tough Post, NBC.com, NBC whatever.com, ABC.com, the mirror.uk, which I don't take much stuff from the uh, mirror.uk. Um, I miss a story that I actually wanted to put, which is about the oldest porn star in the world, 80 some 90 years old porn star. It says he eats eggs. So start eating eggs, you can be a 90 year old porn star. But they can even put that in a newspaper. To tell you, it's like, hey, neighbor, I seen you in the paper. Sorry about your, you know, your pending divorce that I seen in the leader on my newspaper that I got from the gas station on a little stand with a thrifty nickel. That kind of like would almost piss me off a little bit. I don't know how they find how they do these records checks or whatever they do. But however they do it, I don't want I don't want them to do it. <laughs> I don't want them to know of everything about my life and like they had one for marriages too and they have a bunch of other random stuff but it's like basically put out there that hey i'm getting divorced blah 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 that's kind of messed up to me no it won't be because when i do get married to the karate hottie she has more money than me and you can throw that in there all you want and i'll get some of that ufc winnings but i i'd make sure i do everything for that girl uh <laughs> But uh, 
yeah, just putting that in the newspaper. And then just to stay on that uh, UFC topic, topic with uh, you know, that Pearl Gonzalez girl, UFC fight with fake breast. It's kind of crazy that they let people fight like that. I can't see why they wouldn't. Have, like, you have some kind of protection. Like, I don't see them punching each other in the boobs too often. But I've tried to look up stories. Like, I actually thought I'd seen one a while back where, like, someone got a sports thing. And I looked it up as much as I could and couldn't find it. But, uh, it didn't really happen. Like, China had it happen in a wrestling match. They actually banned it in Louisiana, I think, back in 2010, where the boxers couldn't fight with them. Now, she lost, and that's great and all. But, like, why is that a big deal? Because she has fake breath. And it's not like they're just running roughshod and punching each other in the breast. I mean, you're punching each other in the face, or you're putting them. I mean, I guess if you get a nice little leg kick and miss or something like that, it, it could be a possibility. But it's not understandable why it would be a big old thing. I was, I was, but is that now? No, as I was talking about earlier, I was talking about listening to wrestling podcasts and stuff like that, which I don't just. It's not just wrestling. I listen. I what I did was I, I dig through podcasts. I don't have like the best way to go for podcasts is really iTunes or Apple Podcasts. However, that works. Is to find the best podcast, but. Like, I don't, like, some of these podcasts, I just, like, I don't understand the whole Bill Simmons thing. I don't understand the Stephen A. Smith thing. I don't understand how people can sit there and actually listen to that kind of stuff. Because it's mostly a lot of junk. And if you're an ESPN person, you're really talking a whole lot of NBA. And, and we're, we don't, we don't get, maybe we'll get into some NBA. Maybe I'll get somebody that actually knows what the fuck they're talking about. Because I don't, I don't watch it. I really don't. I watch a, ten times more college basketball, which is, hey, you, I'm gonna be watching a lot more this year with the way Mizzou's recruiting. And it's nice to see that you get a guy like Lorenzo Omar, which I liked. Slew back in the day kept Slew prominent for a little while. Loses his job in Washington, you get a guy like Michael Porter. I just don't understand the lore of some of these these people. Like I honestly think that I'm smarter than Stephen A. Smith. I honestly think that. But it would, it, they're kind of almost building a crossover, it seems like, with the WWE and UFC. You know, Brock Lesnar, Bellator did it with uh, Bobby Lashley. You see Dave Bautista, CM Punk. And others talk of Shane O'Mac, Shane McMahon. And you can tell it's still Tom, a little kid. Shane O'Mac uh, could possibly make, get into the ultimate, ultimate fighter. Into the MMA business. Now there was rumors that years ago Shane was actually going to try to buy the UFC when it was actually easy enough to buy. Now, I don't know if this is really just to try to make it build a crossover, try to get more prominent. You could get on the USA Network maybe and try to work with the and commercials and fighters making appearances and stuff like that. But why is it some kind of type of problem? Like, who would want to, like, if you're fake fighting in real fight, are they trying to make WWE seem more real, or is UFC really they're losing money, which their stock has plummeted, but the WWE has too, and maybe they're trying to build them back up. Like, and I watched a fight over the weekend, Joe Belazon got absolutely robbed in a fight, I don't care, I don't know how you want to judge it, I don't know how they judge it. But I absolutely got robbed in a fight, and maybe it's stuff like that because uh, a while back it happened, and uh, when they first had the fights in New York, where the judges were basically didn't know what the hell they were doing, the referees didn't know what the hell they were doing, and that's probably gonna lose its luster when people see these kind of things and say, "Hey, man, this this isn't the UFC I was watching. This isn't this is how it should be, and this is how it's not." And three million people still watch wrestling every week. I don't know how many watch UFC. Those numbers, they don't put them numbers. It seems like out there too often. But they still get their pay per view buys. They still have, the, they're still on Fox. And not just on FS1, they're still on the regular Fox, which pretty much all sports has been taken off them regular channels except for hockey. And then the small little sports, you see the St. Louis FC is on Channel 11 here in St. Louis. And you see 
some of the college sports every now and then on the backup channels for 2, 4, 5, 9, 9, 9, but 11 to 30. They actually ring an honor show runs their show at I think on midnight to channel 30 on Saturday and Sunday. So there's still some kind of a war for the UFC. There's still people watching it. But they it's pretty much lost its stock. And that's why you hear these smaller rumors. You hear about Ronda maybe coming to the WWE. You hear about Shane McMahon coming to UFC. Uh you see every now and then I'm talking about Brock and CM Punk. Maybe Dana and the guys at UFC see a little lore with maybe teaming up with WWE and maybe Vince McMahon sees it. It's the same way. But it would be kind of cool to see a guy like Shane O'Mac who goes out there and gives it all in every wrestling match. And maybe he is the type of guy that can make something happen to make bring the two companies kind of in a partnership. And I don't know if it'd be kind of cool. You know, I don't know if it'd be cool. I mean, I still watch a little bit of wrestling. Not much, but my kids like it. So I'm, I'm still in the, not in the know, but I know what the hell I'm talking about. Now I'm, gonna go, I'm probably going to get stuck watching a dumpster match tonight with Braun Strowman and Kalisto. I don't know what else is going on. <laughs> That's about it. They were calling it a gimmick match. But, I mean, two two of a really big, the biggest, the smaller sports in terms of the four major ones, but two p things that could make money that could maybe come together and be, and fight for the television time that some of these sports get. ESPN's starting to show it, which means that Fox Sports is, is does a lot of articles. I don't watch a whole lot of FS1. Maybe they talk about it a little bit, but you see that, Wrestling is actually starting to gain a little bit of traction. I don't know if that's some kind of thing where they're trying to make money off of each other. Blah, blah, blah. But it would be kind of cool to see like someone actually try it that would be a little more exciting than you know, having your weight going out there and Brock or Lashley. and You know, and, because, I mean, that's a big fighter. But you get the smaller fighter, like a shame of man. That could be kind of fun. Or seeing like a Ronda come in and go and get some of these fighters in the uh, WWE to, you know, kind of show if this year if she has more talents than she actually has, because she hasn't been a very good UFC fighter lately, so it's just something to see. I have a small little story about some people that live in Connecticut. These two girls. When Carmen and Lupia Andre were born, doctors said they only had three days to live. The conjoined twins, now 16, originally born in Mexico and now living in Connecticut, Defy their odds and live past their doctor's expectations. Health problems have emerged and placed the girls' futures at risk, but they tell the Hoffer Concord that they don't see a point in surgery that could end up killing them. The whole physiological situation, Carmen, phys physiological situation, Carmen says, but we be says because we've been used to being together. I don't think there'd be a point. The girls were brought to the United States by their parents, who sought medical expertise for their daughter's condition. Each of the girls has a heart, a set of arms, a set of lungs, and a stomach. But they share some limbs, their circulatory systems, and their digestive and reproductive systems. Doctors have told them that a surgery to separate them could end in serious neurological problems or death. Despite these overwhelming obstacles, the girls have thrived in school and in their personal life. Carmen told the Condrick, a lot of people don't notice how different we are because when they first meet us, we kind of have the same reactions. She continued, but our friends, once they get to know us, our friends literally tell us, you guys are so completely different. I'm like, yeah, well, we're two different people. Carmen adds that her sister has always been deeply involved in her life. There's been per a person here listening about my crap. She says, I guess there's an emotional attachment to my sister. Despite Lupia only having 40% lung capacity, according to the contract, and a, se a severely cursed spine, the sister said they rather live their lives than run the risk of losing each other. There's a lot of risk. To it, it actually, then it actually being beneficial. So we are. Carmen begins decided not to go through with the surgery. When the PF finishes, we're going to live out our lives, and that's it. And that's originally published on People Magazine. I found it on Yahoo Sport. Now, basically, my best friend is my brother. But I'm telling you, if we were connected, and there was a surgery to get us apart, that'd be the first thing we're doing. 
Now, I have two kids that live together their whole lives, young now. I just don't think that they would want to be together 24-7. I just, I mean, and my kids love each other. They love their other, their stepbrother, or not their stepbrother, but their other brother. Cool little kid. Uh, but I can almost all but guarantee that if me and my brother had a chance to separate and we were together, that we would run, run the risk of the surgery to become apart. Now, in this situation, I shouldn't say because they're only 16 years old, but hey, you know, two girls, one time. Can't beat that. So, I mean, when you guys turn 18, stay together all you want. But I can all but guarantee you that most people would take this surgery. And this is probably just a story that somebody found and said, hey, you should do this. You're going to make money off this story. Like, how much should people magazine, you know, people magazine and kind of like Time and all them are offering, you know, they offer people money for stories. But can you really look at your family member and say, I want to be connected to you for the rest of my life? Like, we're already connected because we're brother and sister. And we've been around each other enough. But you, on the side of my hip, it's starting to really tick me the fuck off. <laughs> and how would you date that? Like, how do they, like, I can see you hanging out with friends and stuff like that. Like, how does that work if you're, like, getting high or something? Like, do they both get high? Like, like, do they get X doubly high? Like, that would be, like, some, some kind of science experiment that I would like to achieve. But I think that's probably it on that. Like, if we drink one, like, if I drink a beer and she don't, does we both get drunk? Like, how does that work out? And, and I, you know, love my brother to death. Love my sister to death. I wouldn't want to be connected to him 24-7. Like, how do you, I mean, like, they got their own minds and stuff, and, like, twins, I know, seem to be more in hip to how each other sleep and sh stuff like that. But what about other things, like TV shows and stuff like that? Like, you're going to have different mindsets. Like, what if one wants to get fucked up and one doesn't? Like, that, that doesn't help out. What if one wants to do this and one doesn't? No. I need my own mind. I need to be my own person every now and then. Not for a guy, it would work out perfect. Like some 16 year old guy went out there and said, hey, you know, hey, what's up, girl? You know, blah, 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 bring your sister along. <laughs> and what, what else can she do? Hey, we're going to go out to eat tonight. You got to bring your sister. Like, did she, like, sit off to the side and just stare out with her at the restaurant? Like, and I don't know how that works. I shouldn't have said that. I feel I feel kind of bad right now. Not that I feel too bad. Like, the only good thing it would be for if, like, you were going on a date, like, two women yapping in your ear one time, no. Not in other spots, it would be great. But. That they want to be together doesn't make any sense. And they, they said it was because the surgery could kill them. Well, they're telling you you could die from being together. I would rather have the chance to try to be separate and be alive than to be together and die. That's just me. But it wouldn't make me too happy if uh, we had different interests. It really wouldn't make a date too happy if you, know, you had to feed two miles at once, you know. You, it's enough paying for yourself and the girl. But paying yourself for a girl and her sister. Nah, man, I'm not, I'm not cool with that. No. <laughs> it's just, it's the weirdest stories that I find. And that should have probably been part of Weird News, which coming up here soon, and we'll get to it. But it'd be kind of, it'd be kind of fun at first. Like saying, hey, man, like, let's go party. Let's go sh show these people how we roll, but. Like, you've got to argue a lot. Like, if you're sitting next to somebody 24-7, like, and I had the same girl with me for nine years. Like, we sat together a lot. It's going to involve arguing. Like, how do you, like, get around that? Like, do they just turn their heads to the side and just look the same? Like, do you, like, have two TVs in this separate room? Like, I just want to know how this all works. It doesn't quite make too much sense to be a why you wouldn't want to stay that way. And maybe they just love each other that much, blah, blah, blah. 
you never love a sibling that much. I promise you that. You might love your brother or sister to the fullest. But not enough to just look at that person 24-7 and, you know. It's hard enough for me to look at my kids 24-7. Much less look at somebody that's just related to me 24 so Enough all that. But just more fun with stories on, uh, and that's just what the internet's for. There's really nothing else about point to the internet. Like, they're really not. Like, just to look at the most random stuff. That's how I found this story. The most random stuff. Looking on Twitter, I think I found this story. Just the most random stuff. It just, it's, the internet's nothing. But a big ball of nothing. People say it's a wealth of knowledge. Well, if you actually worked at it, you wouldn't need the internet. And it's nice for a show like this. It's nice. That's how most podcasts work is from the internet. That's where people are getting their information. It's not like I'm out here watching the Cardinal games at Bush Stadium. No, I'm watching them on TV and looking up stats and stuff like that on the internet. Uh, a lot of the pay-per-views that are watched from UFC and stuff like that are done through the internet. It's just a big ball of nothing. That's what the internet is. But it's nice to have it around. All right, let's go to a part of the show, which we like doing. This is where we learn about all your independent sports teams. It's called the Hometown Rundown. On April 15th, the River City Raiders played at home against the Richmond Rough Riders. The Raiders couldn't overcome the six, six turnovers in the game, including three first-half interceptions by quarterback Calvin Hanners, Hamilton and lost 54-39. to 39. Hamilton tried him on a comeback, but the Raiders... Couldn't make it all the way back, and I skip a sentence, obviously. Hamilton ended 14 for 29 for 200 yards, three TDs, three interceptions, and a rushing TUE. They started on the, the Rough Riders started a 19-0 rally in the first half, but, and it was too hard for the NC. That's what happens when you mix up sentences. DeAndre Jackson had a good game. Another good game, which he's the star of the team. DeAndre Jackson talked about him last this year. I talked about him a lot in River City. And the one show I had this year had 65 yards receiving, two touchdowns, and also had a 50 time, 50 yard return TV, TD. The Raiders were supposed to play on the road against the Alabama Outlaws on the 22nd, but the Outlaws Arena had technical issues, and the game has to be rescheduled for May 6th. The Raiders' next game is at home at the Family Arena, and St. Charles against Savannah, the Savannah Coastal Outlaws. You got to come up with a better name. We already got that loss. But Oh, well. On April 29th at 7 p.m. You can watch some games on YouTube. Uh, actually, it's on, I think, backlight.tv. But you can watch. There's a way to watch these games. Same thing with UF, STLFC. St. Louis FC is actually on YouTube 24-7 whenever they play. And they also got games that we'll talk about here in a second on TV. On April 12th, St. Louis FC continued their undefeated season on the road, defeating the Pittsburgh Riverhounds 2-1. The Riverhounds started to score in the fifth minute. Threw up one nothing. Former USL MVP with the River Hounds in 2013, Jose Angelo, scored on an assist from West Sharpie in the 30th minute to tie the game at one. In the 68th minute, on another assist from Sharpie for the third straight game, Kristen Valeski scored the game-winning goal. Which he's going to be a star. He's not going to be on this team much longer this season. He's going to be going up to the MLS. Uh, I mean, it just. The guy this is exceptional at playing offense. He scored a game-winning goal in the 68th minute. They played again on the road on April 15th in their television debut on KPR 11, losing their first game of the season 4 to nothing to FC Cincinnati in front of a crowd of over 23,000. Now, that's got to be hard to play with, but the game this week had 4,000. Your high attendance, I think, is 5,500 at Toyota Stadium in Fenton. And now you're in front of a crowd of 23,000. That's got to be a whole different thing. That's got to be a whole different animal. And definitely that you know you're going on TV for your first game. I mean, there had to be a lot on the plate for a lot of them players, like, trying to be different. And that's probably why that they were dominating this game. You know, they had the ball for a lot of the game. It's just they didn't have as good enough chances. Dijabi Fall scored all four goals, attaining a hat trick within the first 48 minutes. They played again on the road, or excuse me, they played again at home at Toyota Stadium in Fenton against the Charlotte Independents, taking the lead in the fourth minute on a, another goal from Jose Angel from his third of the season 
but Charlotte came right back in the ninth minute to even the score. They took the lead in the 29th minute, and the score stayed that way for Independence 2-1 to one win. They go back on the road on April 27th to play the Orlando City B at 6.30. Their first home game is televised, and the next game after that is May 6th at 7.30 against the Rochester Rhinos, and that will be on KPR 11. And not much on the hometown rundown this week. Definitely with the Raiders game getting canceled and stuff like that. Kind of ruins the hometown rundown, but we'll get into we'll get into it more next. Uh, less than a month, and April 13th is when the River City Rascals come back. So get some a little bit more to talk about there. And be uh, the Midwest Professional Basketball Association comes back this summer. So hopefully we'll uh, we'll have a little bit more to talk about. I'll get into it more. You can watch all these games. NBA uh, PA had their own. I was watching games, I think, on their website last year and the year before when I and when this was before I even talked about them on the network because I knew nothing about it. And I don't even know how I found it. But a lot of them games, like most of these independent leagues are starting to figure out you have to have somewhere to watch these games for people to get into it. Which is kind of cool. Um, KPR 11 and, and I think FC actually pays the money to be on 11 pace for the time, which at least they know that they have to get on TV for something. Alright, we're going to do something where I do a lot of work on. But first, I'd like to promote a little something here. STL Prep Sports, stlprepsports.com. Get all your high school information, football, basketball, all that on there. And the guy knows what he's talking about. And also, for all your hunting, decals, shirts, hats, blah, blah, blah. You can go to slingandstitches.com. Also look for both of them on Facebook. Great companies. Don't have nothing to do with this. Just kind of putting things out there. You want to look into it. But that's STL Pro Sports and Sling and Stitches. All right. Something I do to humor myself every week or every time on the show. I humor myself and look for funny stories. But we're moving on to weird news. Humor is a subject thing, especially if the subject is something that could get you arrested, like marijuana. The weed is illegal in Minnesota, which some people aren't high on this 420 tweet from the police department in the town of Wyoming. Undercover 420 operations are in place throughout the city today. Hashtag happy 420. Now let's tweet they have a picture of Doritos, GTA, two bags of Cheetos, an Xbox, then they got a cop in the background with a net. Nothing special, but this is what Twitter's for. I don't even know who uses Twitter anymore. Not big on. I don't even really too often get on there. I don't even write on there. Usually I use it for this show. Like you get a lot of stuff from Derek Gould, but blah, blah, blah. Yet the tweet was meant to be funny, and many people took it, did, took it that way. It was retweeted over 125,000 times, like more than 228,000 times. Not everyone I've ever saw the humor, considering that many people in Arizona still get arrested for marijuana possession every day. Even though medical marijuana is legal in 29 states and recreational in 8 states, including and Washington, D.C., and 61% of Americans support legalization. One tweet, let's get the blood and follicle sample from the police and see if any of them will be celebrating. Another one shows a cop grabbing for some donuts with a sign that says free dozen, saying it's easy to stereotype, isn't it? Police spokesman Paul Hopp told the Huffington Post that the tweet was meant to entrap people but to bring awareness to substance abuse, which extends beyond marijuana, including everything from alcohol to heroin. A few hours after that first tweet, the 420 tweet, the police department tweeted, with that being said, if you need help with substance abuse, please contact us and we'll find resources that that, that does not include jail. Outrageous tweets are nothing new for the Wyoming Police Department. On Super Bowl Sunday, the department sent out a tweet threatening to show Justin Bieber's T-Mobile ad to suspected drunk drivers, and the PD also sent out a 420 tweet last year. Don't get caught. That's basically all that tweet says, and that's all there is to it. Pretty easy stuff. All right, this is from the Montoni, Montana, Wyoming something, Billings Gazette. Harvey Montana resident, or Harv, I don't know. I'm not from Montana. Resident Scott Dion felt he was getting screwed on his taxes. I love this kind of stuff when writers write this kind of stuff. Just awesome stuff. So on November 30th, 2016, when he sent a property tax check into the Hill County Treasurer, he included a note on the memo line. It was a, this is the first time he has done this. 
but this time he wrote on the memo line sexual favors. The check was otherwise normal, a $745 plus payment made out to the county office. But when the county didn't cash the check for months, Dion got his lawyer involved. His lawyer, Jamie Young, sent out letters to the Hill County Treasurer and attorney signing state law as well as First Amendment right for the uncashed check. The treasurer said she didn't know where the truck. Now this is where it gets kind of dicey. And you're, I've read a lot of stuff lately about like what these lawyers can do. I mean, look at Jose. Look, and we'll talk about this in a minute with Jose Bias twice now. How about that guy? That's awesome stuff. But anyways, the treasurer said she didn't know where the check was. Though last time she seen it was last time that she checked it was with the city attorney, the county attorney. The county attorney said, in general, the treasurer can't cash a check if it's not clear what the funds apply to. In general, it doesn't make sense. If a guy sends you a check, you're going to the county treasurer. He's obviously paying his taxes, and if it's for the amount of the taxes, it doesn't quite make any sense. I, and, I mean, $745 seems like a lot of money. Property tax, you better, you better have some good shit over there in Wyoming. Dion said aside from the memo, the rest of the check was normal. Montana Department of Revenue spokesman said that the state conducts assessment, but the tax collection is largely left to the county treasurer. Dion said that the property checks has yet to be cashed. He said the memo line has nothing to do with it. Nothing. In 2016, he said he wrote bullshit into the memo line on his first 2016 tax payment. Now this is where things get dicey. Because if you're casting checks that said bullshit and stuff like that, what's wrong with sexual favors? And the lawyer also said in here, like, that she shouldn't be able to cash the, she shouldn't stop the cash payment check because she didn't like what it said. So, are you, <laughs> this actually, like, proves a little bit that some of these people don't do their jobs. And now you're putting two people on notice in the treasurer and in the county attorney who doesn't even want to talk about it. Because now it's in the newspaper. Now it's out there. And now, I mean, I bet if you looked it up now, which, this happened in February, and I just found it. And I actually, I mean, I looked it up, and, and I don't, this it hasn't been resolved. I guarantee it's been resolved without anybody saying anything. I bet Mr. Dion kept his mouth shut after they came at him and said, all right, we got your cash check. This is how this is going to work, blah, blah. Here, we'll pay your, probably pay his order fees and stuff like that. And, you know, he had the money to do it. I think they said he was a traveling nurse, so he had a little bit of money. This is the great thing about being our next story great thing about being 30 years old this is from the leader as we talked about earlier with the filing divorce thing which shouldn't be in the newspaper a 16 year old male was arrested for possession of drug paraphernalia after his parents took him to the Rica police department at about 1 28 p.m april 16th the parents showed up to the station with their son after finding a syringe that contained a substance that may be drugs in his room lieutenant Danny wilson said that the suspect was claiming he was holding it for somebody else. Wilson also said that the substance was being tested. After the fact, Wilson said that we are also investigating to see who else is involved. For one, you're not going to hold a syringe for somebody else. Because that's somebody else, definitely 16, I don't know how much peer pressure is involved in this. Which peer pressure is a, a bitch most of the time. But... That's a good excuse when you're like 14, 13, 14 years old. When you're 16 years old, you're kind of past the point to where peer pressure should be involved in your life, which I'm 30 years old. I still do no, almost 30. May 14th, maybe we'll do a special sports book for my birthday. If we get that far, who knows how many shows I'll do. I'm a bullshitter. But... <laughs> Yeah, kind of past the point where you can use that excuse that uh, you're holding it for somebody from your parents when they find it in your room and stuff. But this shows you that that actually happened on 420. So it shows you that that's not the only drug being done on 420. Now this story, which I recommend you go look at the best fan of baseball account for this. Just for, it's only two pictures, but it's kind of fun. They find stuff like this. And the best fan of baseball actually found the picture in a... Uh, uh, find a guy in a cardinal shirt, I guess, on his Facebook. Because, you know, these stories always give the names of the people, you know, as you heard. But kind of funny that they do this kind of stuff. And, of course, 
St. Louis guy wearing a Cardinal shirt, and then this happens. A man stole a 90-year-old copy of Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf from a history museum because he tells he told police he was fascinated by it. Robert Charles the Comp was charged with one kind of burglary and theft, both felonies. Surveillance footage caught a man later identified as a cop walking out of the Collinsville Historic Museum on February 21st with a special edition of the Nazi Dictator's book that was printed in Munich in 1927 and presented to Nazi leaders, police said. The book is estimated to be worth at least $3,000 and possibly up to $10,000. He was in there for less than 46 seconds, cops said. You could tell from the video that he had been in there before and knew where it was, said assistant police to the assistant police chief. Museum officials, now this is, this is just why you need to do your job. Museum officials didn't notice the book was gone until April 4th. Tips were called in to police as soon as the photos were placed of the defendant on the department's Facebook page. A few hours before he was arrested, LeCount dropped the book back off at the museum. Officers spotted a car belonging to the man that they knew was a friend of LeCount, and when officers got to the car to talk to the driver, they saw a cop laying on the floor in the back of the car. He was taken into custody with you no know, fight in his bail was set at sixty thousand dollars. When cops in Lecompte, when cops asked Lecompte about stealing the book, the only thing he said was that he was fascinated by it. That was from stltoday.com, and I kind of, I would, if I was gonna rob somebody, forty-six seconds, that's pretty good to get something worth three to ten thousand dollars. Now you can tell the guy's not smart because he went and took it back. So now you're on camera twice doing something stupid, and then you're riding around outside in a car and you're laying in the back seat and. Cops are looking for you, and you're running, and you bring the book back because you're scared of the... It makes no point. Now, you could say whatever you want. They could say whoever you are, but you, you... Surveillance cameras, and the pictures weren't all that clear. You could just see him walk out with a big book under his arm. Are you, I mean, I don't know how good the face the pictures were. And surveillance these days, they got facial recognition and all that bullshit that's going to get anybody in trouble. But... It's funny that you would even think to take the book back. Like you know you're gonna probably be charged with it either way, and maybe it makes you look better. Maybe you can go to the judge with saying, "Hey, man, I, I, I effed up." But you had the book for over a month. It seems like they didn't know it was gone for a while. How did you? I mean, I understand you were fascinated by it, but don't you when you kind of want to get rid of something like that? And why would you hold on to it for that long? If you were fascinated by it, read it, take it back. It's almost like the library, except this guy wasn't smart enough to use it as a library. And they got scared when his face was put on Facebook. This is why social media is the worst, though. Now the cops are using Facebook they didn't use it before. And this is also why social media is the worst. Also from STL today, and I like, and this post is actually starting to get better with the, their headlines for articles. I hated them when I was first doing the show and I wrote them. I wrote this one down. Her stat book. Sir Snapchat post made him angry, so a Lincoln County man beat a woman with a hammer. I mean, just it's pretty blunt. I like it, other than that other crap that they usually throw in. I like it. I don't even know what they say on here. A Lincoln County man who allegedly used a hammer to beat a woman. He was with over the weekend is facing kidnapping and domestic violence assault charges. Police said the 24-year-old victim told police that Levi Dakota Locke was intoxicated and became angry with her over the post she put on Snapchat while attending a family event with Locke. The victim left the event in the vehicle with Locke, who began striking her as he drove, police say. At one point, he stopped and retrieved a hammer from the truck, got back in the car, and hit the woman with a hammer as he drove. Locke allegedly continued to attack the woman at his residence in the first block of Portland Meadows. The woman said she fled to a neighbor's home. When she went to Progress West Hospital for care the first time, she asked staff to report her injuries. But when she returned a few days later from complications related to her injuries, staff contacted police. Lake was charged was arrested on charges that include kidnapping, domestic violence, or domestic assault, excuse me, causing serious physical inju injury. He was last listed in Lincoln County Jail with a, ba a bail set at two hundred thousand dollars cash only bond. And what could you get mad about Snapchat? Like what? Like what? I I had Snapchat for like a week, and if it seems like it's something that, it, that I can involve in this show that will work which in two years I have it, then I would incorporate it into the show. But 
now you're getting to a like a gray area there. Because of social media, you're gonna beat it with a hammer. It is just tough. Lincoln County's weird fuck enough, and I doubt that the guy was just on alcohol. I doubt that she was just on alcohol. If she even drank. It doesn't say much about her, twenty four year old that probably didn't want her name out there, probably didn't want to look like a stupid ass or trying to get the guy in trouble. I most girls understandable, but he stopped the car. Went and grabbed a hammer. I mean this is it defies my brain knowledge of thing when things like this happen. And it's not under, it's just it's not understandable to be the man or the woman in this situation, but kind of funny. I mean, it's just fuck. The, the story's is weird that that someone could get mad over something. You can I can't see what you would post on Snapchat other than a picture, maybe saying, "Hey, how you doing?" Uh, I mean, I don't know how it exactly works. I know you can direct send to somebody. You can post a Snapchat story. It doesn't. I don't know how exactly how it works, but I don't know if it's worth a hammer attack. And now you're, and now this guy's stuck two hundred thousand in cash. I'm like, I mean, people don't work and got less amount of that. Known fact, um, that I know, but <laughs> I'm just crazy. I don't think social media has ever pissed me off that bad. Like social media pisses me off when I go to look for someone on social media that I've seen and can't find. It. Usually it's freaking Facebook. Who Facebook's messed up everything. Used to be able just to untag, you know, just get like push a button and. This person can't see your post. Now you have to like you go down your list and like you have to boom 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 boom. Like that. And why would you change something like that? And then the order the timeline and blah blah blah. And this is the people that you look at. Now how would like? No, that's not the people I look at the most. I accidentally click on something and now I'm on their picture. Now I see the dark post 15 times in a row. Not understandable to me. But that's weird news. Good story today. Now I gotta give big ups to uh, Quinn Snyder, former Mizzou coach, now coach of the Utah Jazz. Basically made his way back after what happened in Missouri with Ricky Clemens and stuff. I'm not gonna talk much basketball. His series tied two to two. Couldn't tell you who he's playing. I honestly don't know. Did you see my hair? I like my hair. Man, that guy's got some nice hair. I want to be 50 with some hair like that. I also want to be 50 and be an NBA coach that's in the playoffs with a 2-2 series. Tied. And Joe Johnson on my team is just like the biggest clutch basketball player of my generation right now. You know, from Michael to LeBron to Kobe and now Joe. I mean, one of the guys that slept on from the Brooklyn days, the Celtics, uh, Phoenix, and the Mike D'Antoni system with Nash, and now with Utah with Quinn Schneider. But you can't be. You, you can't beat that guy's hair. I mean, I don't think it's even changed. And I think he was, I think it was 17 to, or so many, 17 years ago or something like that that he was the coach of Mizzou 15 years ago. I don't think his hair has changed. I think he still looks the same. I mean, that's just some beautiful hair. I mean, I want to know what kind of hair products he chooses. <laughs> I mean, it'd be nice. It'd be nice to get my hair flowing like that. I mean, it's just flowing. It's beautiful right now the way it is. Until I get fucked up one night, fuck it up, or I get on the show a little hammered and it looks like if a mop, like someone said a mop on top of my head, which messing up like that just did. <laughs> but, uh, man, that guy's hair is exceptional. And I mean, there's not many other people I can compare it to. Because I don't watch a whole lot of TV. I listen a lot, like I said, I listen to a lot of podcasts, mostly St. Louis radio shows that I like and stuff like that. But man, that guy's got some great hair. I was seeing that lawyer uh, earlier in that weird news with the guy that wrote the bad check. How about Jose Bias, man? If I'm going to hire a lawyer, number one, I'm not going to create more crimes in Missouri. I'm going to go to Florida. Because <laughs> this guy is, I mean, Heron Hernandez, which that story is weird. We're going to talk about that a little bit in a second. But I mean, I've been reading a lot of stories about it. It's like some of these lawyers have really gotten smart and like figured out laws. And like, there's actually a thing on Facebook called barcomplaint.com. This show like what these lawyers do. And like, there's lawyers that like find little loopholes to get 
sexual assault cases off your record because of one little thing is the court did. There's another one I've seen today that was on bargainplate.com. Uh, bargainplate.com on Facebook. I, I don't think I've ever been on a website. I think when you click on the story, most of the stories take you to the Washington Post, which the Washington Post has some of the most crazy stories. I mean, like that. That's probably the best newspaper. It's like this was like a political show, which will never be a political show. But you never know. You never know how bad it's going to get. Maybe will it get bad enough to where I'll have to do political shows. It might get bad enough where I just sit here and talk an hour about my drunk escapades. Uh, <laughs> but that guy, Jose, two people off murder that it seemed clear as day were going to be murderers. And, and man, that's going to, I don't know how much it would charge him to get him here, but man, if I ever have a freaking case, Jose Baez is going to be my guy. And I think one of these, I think the lawyers I was looking at about the guy that got the sexual assault stuff off his case were from Illinois. So it's crazy how like we think like the generations get dumber and dumber, but that's just us, the stupid people, <laughs> the people that don't give a fuck. But there's actually people that care, that actually are getting better and better because, I mean, if you remember like a lot of ten years ago, like, people say like we're innocent, but this was the best case scenario, or I'm going to prison. Like I fought the case long enough, I can see where it was going, and I took the plea deal. I mean, now you see it to where people don't even take plea deals anymore. Because they, because the lawyers like find these loopholes and find these little small things that make the prosecutor look dumb. Like the, the thing I watched in Casey answer the three part series, which, God, that's how lame I've gotten. As I'm watching the, I, I whined about the ID network the last time on the show, and then I'm sitting here watching the three part series of Casey and Anthony on the ID network, where the judge even said she's guilty. She, I, 100% sure she's guilty. And you got a guy like Jose Bias that goes out there. Gets her to plead out. Gets her out of it. Then he goes out there where it looks like Aaron Hernandez is guilty as shit. And he's part of a lawyer team that makes it look like everybody else, but Aaron Hernandez is the bad guy. And he got an extra four years. And Then he killed himself after he was going to go. Looks like they were going to go after the old Lloyd case, too. No, he probably would have never got his life back. He probably would have been stuck somewhere. He was going to have to serve at least four or five. Let's just say he got out of that case. He was still had to be in prison. For the gun charters and stuff like that so i mean there's things in there where you could see that where he was probably flipping out but today like like i'm gonna like, if i'm gonna get a lawyer i'm gonna get one of these young people like i've had lawyers before most of them older that you know the judges and you know you talk to them and they're like well i know this guy but why and they go in there and they get you pleaded down to blah blah, blah but it's, you know it's always an extra fine you know keep points off your license the judge is gonna say you know well, this fine was 300 but now it's 450 Plus, you got to pay your effing lawyer, too, which is a crock of shit. But that's the way things work in this world. But I'm going to go find one of these young people that, you know, are trying to make make it look like they're the good lawyers and make a difference. Hey, you can please get me out of a case. I'm all down for it. Definitely for... I, mean, I got cases right now for stuff I didn't do. But my dumb ass, you know, doing dumb thing. This is what you don't do. If you're if you're anybody, as you don't make it an apparent that you're involved with something you're not involved with, and that's kind of what I've done, and that's kind of what made it look like Jose Bias did with uh, Aaron Hernandez made it look like that he wasn't involved with something that people thought he was involved with. I mean, myself look like I was involved with something I shouldn't have been involved with, and I wasn't involved. Small little piece, <laughs> but that's just, I mean that's just the way life works though. So. You know things happen. Money talks, bullshit walks. Yeah, that's the way it happens. Is they want their money, and your bullshit's not gonna get through it. That's what most lawyers and courts and police and everybody. That's how everybody is. Fuck, it's the way it is when you're at your job. Fuck all the bullshit. I'm here to make money. That's really how it is. That's really how the world works. Works nowadays. I'm telling you right now, if someone gets me out of the case, I, I can give them all the money they want. They can have double the money if they get me out of something that, you know, I'm going to go to jail for for a long time. Which, one of my cases, I'm not going to go to jail for anything. Pay small little fines and walk away. But it's crazy to think that they can get you out of 
murder cases, sexual assault charges, anything off your record nowadays, just by finding these small little loopholes that are probably laws from the 1950s or maybe even earlier than that. And maybe some even later than that, where people really weren't thinking about what was going on. I mean, that Harry Hernandez thing is crazy. Like, just read some of the shit that I read. I was scared that they like to get that guy out of jail. Like, that they were going to let him out of jail. With some of the stuff he did. And then he, he gets off a charge and then goes in there and kills himself. And supposedly he's writing letters to his gay prison lover and smoking weed inside the jail. I mean, that guy's a nutball. That guy was a nutball. It's bad to talk ill of the dead. But, nutball. And that's what, they, that's what they did in the court case. They talked ill of the dead, and that's how most of the way he got off. But to be that, to be that crazy to be involved with what he was involved in was making the money he was making. And it seems like that there was other NFL players involved, and they're just not getting out there. I mean, this guy, Old Moy, that he killed was a semi-football player. It's crazy to see some of this stuff. And it's, I mean, it probably happens more than we think. We probably just don't hear about it because they they probably try to keep that stuff under wraps. So you're not out there with the football players and the, the baseball players and all that getting the charges for what they're getting. You know what I'm saying? It's crazy to think about. Like, I kind of want to, like, a remake of all my court cases to see what I could have got out of, you know? And most of my stuff happened when I was way younger. Most of my tickets happened when five, six, like I didn't get a ticket for almost five years. And my license was suspended for three years after that. And I just got lucky for most of the time. I think I, I actually got pulled over one time for my license being suspended probably the first year into it. But after that, you know, usually in where I was living, if you mess with the cops and you were going to jail, you don't mess with the cops, you were going to jail. And I didn't mess with the cops now from some of my jail stuff. It's the people I put myself around. My fault. Life's life. Now I'm back here where I'm at now, you know, stuck in a situation where I don't want to be stuck in. And not that I want to be stuck in a situation I was stuck in there, you know, getting fucked up and jumping out broken windows and <laughs> some of the craziest, nuttier stuff I did. And I, now I want to look up stories about people jumping out of broke windows. Fucked up. You know, you've seen that with the, some of the videos they used to put on YouTube with the people doing the K2 or the bath salts. And, like, people, I didn't jump off a third story floor. I jumped out of my back window about five foot down and drove my car to go. I needed oil from Quick Trip. And at that time, I needed oil from Quick Trip. No one in my car needed oil. It was leaking oil. And then I woke up the next day and my car parked in the middle of the street. So that tells you how bad I really did need to go be driving. But things happen. You get better, your life goes on. Alright, that's gonna do it for Paul and Lori. For Jake, Joe, Maddie, and Zach. This has been a sports blog on the Greater STL Sports Network.